All right, last time we started talking about images um, and, you know, given that this is a multimedia class, you know, we talk about images. The implication is we're talking about digital images uh, because, you know, everything in this class is digital. And to back up a couple steps, one thing, remember, as, as I talk about this, the stuff that we talk about, one element of multimedia is definitely relevant uh, when we talk about other pieces of multimedia. So when we talk about digital images, effectively what we're talking about is taking an image and converting it into a bunch of numbers. That's what digital means, numbers. Sometimes we call that digitizing an image. You know, if we take, for example, a painting that someone did and put it on a scanner, that scanner is going to go through the process of taking and converting that picture into a set of numbers. All right. Now, one thing that we can that that we'll see across the board, and and, and we'll talk about this, is a couple things. First of all, as a general rule, quality and file size move together. Which makes sense, right? Because the more information you store about something, the better quality it is. You know, if we are going to talk about storing simply one number, we can store the difference between white and black. If we store four numbers, then maybe we can store four different colors, and so on and so on and so forth. All right? So as a general rule, the more numbers we store, the higher quality it is. All right? And we're going to see this, again, throughout various multimedia. The same thing is going to be true typically with video. The same thing is going to be true with audio and, and animation and all that. A last consideration is the notion of compression. And last time we were specifically talking about bitmap or raster images, all right? And with those digital images, that's where the, the image is converted into a bunch of numbers. And we talked about a bitmap is literally a map of all the different pixels on the screen, all right? Each pixel, if you imagine we have a 10 by 10 pec, uh, pixel, We have a 10 by 10 pixel, we might have to store 10 by 10, 100 different numbers. Then depending on how big the numbers are, would determine the quality of image. So what would in total determine the quality of the image would be, number one, how many numbers we store for each image, or for our, uh, I'm sorry, how many pixels there are, and number two, how many numbers we store for each pixel. That would tell us the size of a given bitmap image like this. So how many pixels, how many numbers we store for each pixel. What, what does more numbers per pixel mean? Better quality of color, right? As we talked about last time, in nature, you know, even if you look at something like this tabletop or the shirt or anything around you, it may seem like it's one color, but really when you talk about all the subtleties of shadow and maybe like fabric fading or whatever, all right, there's actually a whole bunch of colors in there, all right? So when we talk about the file size, one way to limit the file size of something is by limiting the number of colors. And that's exactly what we do with GIFs. GIFs are limited to 256 colors which effectively is one number per, for each color, all right? We noticed then, when we looked at the gradient last time, that we lose the quality of color, though, whereas with a JPEG, the gradient went very smoothly from the darkest blue to the lightest blue. With a GIF, we noticed that it actually sort of looked like a checkerboard going down the line. It actually 
sort of came up with colors by putting two colors close together so that at a distance your eye would be full and see it as a third color. All right. Now that's one way to compress it, is to limit the number of colors. A second way to compress it is to get clever by the way that you store those numbers. For example, in a, in a, a BMP format, there's no compression. which means that there's going to be a number stored with each pixel. For other formats, there's some forms of compression done. What that means is, what that means is if there's blocks of colors, instead of storing that, com that number for the color a thousand times, or let's say 20 times, it may store some indication saying, hey, by the way, the next 20 pixels are red or blue or green or whatever. So there's ways of getting clever about storing it where you don't have to store literally a number for each of those. And that's what GIFs do, that's what JPEGs do, and that's what PNGs do, is they're a form of compression. All right. Now, there's two kinds of compression. All right. Lossless and lossy, all right? What's the difference between the two? In lossy compression, you lose some information. In lossless compression, you do not lose any information. What do I mean by losing information? Um, I mean that, for example, if I store a JPEG, with many applications, you're given a choice of what quality of JPEG it is. In other words, they're saying how much you want to compress it. The lower quality you make the JPEG, all right, the bigger, or I'm sorry, the, the more compression is going to be done, the smaller file size that you're going to get. But as we know, file size goes up, quality goes up. File size goes down, the quality goes down. All right, how does it do it? It does it by approximating things, right? In other words, if you have two blues that are really close together, eh, maybe it will store it as one color just to, to do a little bit of compression on it. All right? So you lose a little quality. It doesn't look precisely like it did before. But depending on what you're using it for, that may matter or that may not matter. All right? GIFs are lossy because by their nature they only store 256 colors, which really is not that many colors. All right? not, definitely not enough to, to have any kind of photograph of quality at all. So typically GIFs are used for line drawings. Now, what's the implication of lossless versus lossy compression? How's that going to affect how you edit your photos? Lossy versus lossless compression. If you're going to lose data, you might not take the same quality measures to, to do things. Okay. Can you clarify that? Um, with filtering out certain areas, or if it's just going to get lost, you might not. You okay. Might not put as much detail in it, I guess. Is. Okay. Possibly. Possibly you might go for a simpler picture. Any other thoughts? Here's what I'm thinking. Oh, go ahead. I've tried to uh, change the J high quality, good color JPEGs into GIF files. And pixel for pixel didn't change anything. I, well, bring an example, and I'd like to take a look at it. Um, I got one you can look up online. Sure. All right, well, we'll take a look at it. Now, I guess what I'm saying is the implication is this. How many of you, how many of you remember when instead of burning CDs, you made tapes of records? <laughs> all right. Probably only a handful of us, right? Here's what used to happen. If you made a tape of a record, all right, then you took that tape and made a copy of that tape. Then you took that tape and made a copy of it. Because the copying process of tapes is a lossy format, you're losing a little quality at each time, right? Theoretically, with a CD, because it's digital and that's a lossless transfer, theoretically, if I have a CD and copy it, then make another copy of it, then make another copy of it, all the copies should have the same quality, all right? Again, within some parameters. Definitely to a greater degree if you did the same thing with cassette 
or eight track tapes, let's pretend. All right, you're definitely gonna be losing a bit quality. Similar idea here. My edit should always be based off of the original. All right, because if I have an original image, that's the best quality it's gonna get, right? Barring any tweaks that you do or fixes or whatever. That is truest to the original image that you can get. So if I go and I make a copy, or if I take that image and edit it and save it, depending on how I save it, I may have lost some data, all right? Which means that if I use the copy, the next time I do an edit, I'm going to lose even more data and more data. And again, the, the overall quality is going to degrade. So you keep a copy of your original and don't touch it, then you make edits to that and, and save the edit. So, for example, if I took an image and I didn't like how, I, I thought the image was too dark, I might brighten it up a bit. And then, let's say I put it in my project. Then I look and say, you know what, I want to change this uh, image, change the contrast on it. I wouldn't take the one that I changed the brightness on and change the contrast. I would take the original and repeat the edit of the contrast and the brightness. All right? That's a way to, to keep a, a higher quality on it. All right? We'll see when we go and edit some of these images, some of uh, these JPEGs, um, specifically how um, you are asked. Because it doesn't come out and tell you, like, do you want to lose quality or whatever. It asks you what percentage of quality, how, what, what level of quality do you want. And you pick a number from 1 to 100, and from that, it will compress it more. It will say, yeah, those two colors are about the same, and put them together. All right? PNG. By the way, what did we observe last time with PNG, typically, and what did you what were you recounting before class? It's like in between JPEG and bitmap. Yeah, it's, it's, they're bigger than JPEGs. All right, PNG is a lossless compression. All right, and PNG also has some other benefits too, and that is it supports transparency. All right, that's especially important in uh, web contacts texts because you might want an image that has a transparent background so that you can set it on top of anything. You know, if I have a company logo, um, I wouldn't, you know, I might want to set my company logo on a page that's blue, on a page that's green, on a page that's red, and I want a different background depending on where it's sitting off of. Well, the easiest way to do that would be to make a, um, uh, an image with, with transparency so that I can see it. GIFs also support transparency, by the way. So GIFs and JPEGs both uh, support, no, 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 GIFs and PNGs both support transparencies where JPEGs don't, all right? They all have their advantages and disadvantages, right? If there was one that was only advantages and no disadvantages, then there would be no reason to talk about the other ones, right? It's like, well, you know, never use those, all right? Any questions? But they all have their distinct advantages and disadvantages. That's why it's important to know it. And even if you're not an expert on like exactly how the compression is done or anything, have a general idea of what it means to compress it, what it means to have lossy compression versus lossless compression. Yes? Wouldn't, like on a web page, wouldn't a JPEG require more local resources if you were loading a web page? I mean, you'd have to download, like if you had bitmaps and JPEGs on the same group, like <coughs> pages with different image formats. Right. You'd need more bandwidth to download a BMP page. Right. But the JPEG would require more processing power and memory to decompress it, wouldn't it? Possibly, but it's a question of what the scarce resource is. And typically the bandwidth is the one that you're more interested in saving. So, yeah, the processing, you know, if you're talking about processing typical images, yeah, uh, the, your, your client computer might work a little harder decompressing a JPEG than, than it would with a bitmap. But it's not worth Typically, it would not be worth the, band, the bitmap. Bitmaps are not necessarily supported by all browsers either. That's not really a standard format. Um, and again, don't confuse bitmap, the category of images, with the BMP format, which is uh, the Microsoft, because JPEGs, GIFs, and PNGs are all, quote, bitmap formats. All right. Um, There is one other kind of images besides bitmaps or, and raster images, and that is vector images. 
And vector images is going to be hard to demonstrate because I don't know if I have any software on this machine to do that. Let me check real quick. Does not seem like I do. A vector is, again, it's often used in animations and used in video games. And, and here's the idea of a vector. All right? Let's say I'm doing Pac Man. All right? What's Pac Man look like? Pac-Man looks like this, or something like that, all right? If I were to, and, and let's say Pac-Man is shaded in a color, and of course, what's the difference between Pac-Man and this Pac-Man? This Pac-Man has a bow on her head, right? That's, that's the chief difference between the two. If I were to store that as a bitmap, all right, to account for a curve, It's really going to be storing these pixels in a grid that sort of approximates a curve. But at the size, and when, when they're close together and the size and the way it's done, it looks like a curve to you. However, if I made that bigger, it would become apparent that it's not a curve, that it would look like a step. Let me go and demonstrate that with a bitmap, and then we'll talk about how a vector is. Let me go in. Isn't that the main advantage of the vector? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we can sit, we'll be able to see the problem with raster, but we won't be able to see the cure. You have to use your imagination for vectors. Something else I find. using GIMP 2.6 and your link is 2.8. The one that we download to use at home. Off of. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So you, you've got us using newer software. <laughs> well, I like a challenge. <laughs> My guess would be that in most uh, important features, they're, they're yeah. similar enough where it's not going to matter. All right, let's go and let's draw a circle. We'll draw a circle here and we'll fill it in with some color. All right, if we look at that, that looks like a circle, right? Now, if we go and we made this a lot bigger, if we expanded this, you know, that looks pretty much like a circle. If we went in and we expanded it, and let's see, where do we do that in this? There we go, thank you. Notice now how it gets bigger. It's clear that that circle really isn't a circle. It's a series of little lines that at that at the small enough display looks like a circle. But when we make it bigger, because of the nature of the bitmap, it's making a little mosaic. Remember those pixels, all right? When we make it bigger, we see the fact that hey, that's actually a mosaic and that's not a clean curve. That is that. Well, how do vector, vectors fix that? Vectors don't have that problem. Vectors have uh, are such that if you take a vector image and make it bigger, it's a still a good copy of it. You don't lose anything. You don't get the jaggy. Is it uh, a edges. Well, what it does is it stores the image as a series of like equations and, and mathematical expressions, which means that you have a circle that is so big. If you change the parameters and say, I don't want a radius of 2, I want a radius of 4, yeah, it can still draw a circle, and it's still a circle at 4. That's why if you notice, again, in a lot of, and if you go back, it's probably more apparent if you go back um, a few generations in video games, where you could see the characters being composed of polygons, right? And each of those polygons, each of the little triangles that build up someone's head, or circles, or whatever, all right, 
you can write some mathematical expression for it, right? And if you want to make it bigger, it's just, well, head times two. Boom, everything gets bigger. And that, that way you don't lose any quality. I don't know, maybe quality isn't the right choice of words, but you don't really lose any resolution or quality as that. You can make it look bigger and smaller. For the most part of this class, we're going to be concerned with raster graphics, but you should at least have an awareness of, of the vector graphics. All right. Let's see. Where can you get images from? If you have a project, a multimedia project, and you have to get images, where can you get images from? It's not a trick question. Google. If you do an advanced search, you can get Okay. All right. Number one, you can get you can get images off the web provided they are licensed with a Creative Commons license. All right. You're not allowed simply to take images off the web and use them. All right. However, certain creators of content have gone in and have said, "Hey, look, the images that I uh, that I'm putting on the web, I'm going to allow people to use them." And they may put some restrictions on that. They may say, for example, you can use them, but you have to give me credit. They may say you can use them, but um, you can't alter them. In other words, you can't take the picture and like put another person in it, you know, or alter it. Uh, or they might say you can you can do it provided you're not a business that's making money off of it. So approved for non-commercial. This whole thing is called Creative Commons licensing. This again has parallels across different kinds of multimedia because. What can you do? How can you create these different multimedia elements? You can do it yourself, right? You can go get a camera and snap pictures. If I was doing a website for Wayne Community College, I could go out and boom, snap pictures. And the quality of digital cameras now is such that you could probably get pretty good images with not terribly expensive equipment. Not like in the old days when you had your Instamatic or whatever, snapping pictures and the quality wasn't that good. So I can take the images myself, or I can get someone else to do it. Get someone else to do it, one option would be to go and hire a professional photographer. All right? If you were taking, uh, if you were doing a website for an organization and you wanted a professional looking portrait of your CEO, you might hire a photographer to go and do that. All right? Good quality image, has the best equipment, knows everything about lighting and studios and all that kinds of stuff. All right? Another option is to go with stock photography. Now, stock photography is where you go out and you find a website that sells or offers via Creative Commons license photography that more or less fits your need. For example, if I was doing LC's website and I wanted to show a gathering of students in a classroom, right? really wouldn't matter if the students actually went here or not, right? I'm just illustrating a point that here we have a classroom full of students and they're working on a computer lab or whatever. So I could go out and I could purchase a stock photo that's professionally taken, all right, of students sitting in a computer lab working, and I could use that. Now, the advantage is it's going to be professional quality, which I may or may not be able to duplicate, all right? But it's not going to be so expensive as hiring a professional to come in and take pictures just for me, all right? Let's look, uh, again, the, the, the sort of wild card in here, these are the options that have exist, existed forever, by the way, for how you get your images. The wild card with this is lately there is the notion of Creative Commons licensing. So let's go around, let's do some searches for these things real quickly uh, before we get into doing some editing with the GIMP. All right, what was I doing? Let me go to iStockPhoto.com. This is a famous uh, online stock photography. The internet, by the way, has sort of killed this business. Right? Because in the old days, if you're doing a brochure, you go to a professional photographer that have a portfolio of pictures, and you'd have to go to a professional photographer to have a nice portfolio of pictures. Here, anyone with a decent camera, a little bit of time, can do reasonably good pictures. And 
if you've taken any economics class, if the supply of something greatly increases and the demand stays relatively constant, the price goes way down. So what I can do is I can search for something, let's say. I'll do a search for computer lab. And here's a bunch of pictures of people in a computer lab. So if I was doing Elsie's website and I didn't have a good camera, or I wasn't confident in my photo taking abilities, and I didn't want the expense of hiring a photographer, I could go in and say, yeah, this one looks good. And I can buy it. If I want that size, it will cost me nine bucks. If I even wanted a, a, a ginormous size, it would, it would cost me only 43 bucks. Which is, you know, compared to hiring someone to come in and take pictures just for you, that's a pittance. All right? But if you're doing something for a website, maybe you could get by with the extra small. It only costs you nine bucks. All right? These are royalty free. And what that means is, is you pay the nine bucks, you can use it. You don't have to pay, like, you know, like uh, every, for every brochure that you print, or if you put this like in a book for every book that you sell, or, or anything like that. So that's what it means when it says royalty free. All right. Let's do some searches for Creative Commons licensed pictures, which again are typically free to use with some conditions attached to it. Now let's see, let's go to Google Images and after you do your search, yeah, that, that annoys me. Let's do a search for computer lab. Just thinking about it. All right, maybe you can't get images this way. I stand corrected. <laughs> Excuse me? There we, go. there we go. All right. There we go. I was thinking about it. So I can go in here. And if I now go, where is the advanced? Under here or under here? Under there? Yeah. Under here, there is an option for advanced search. And I can look for things down at the bottom that is filtered by a Creative Commons license. This one, not filtered for license, means that it is a standard copyright, which means you can't use that image unless you get a person's permission. Now, in a classroom environment, we could use it, but if we're talking about general usage of it, you can't use it. Here, it's free to use or share. The assumption is not in a commercial way, though, so I could put this on my personal blog, maybe, but not on a commercial website. Here's free to use or share even on a commercial website. Free to use, share, or modify, again, on a personal site. Free to use, share, or modify even commercially. So this is a least restrictive license, which means that I could download this, use it for my business, and put myself in the background teaching the class by modify the image. So let's go and let's do that search, and we'll see what we get. All right? All of these are licensed that way. So I could take, if I wanted to, Say one of these. And I could download this. Whoops. Yeah, I could download this and I could use it on a commercial site and I could edit it and so on. All right, so you can find it through Google search. <laughs> yeah, it's well, yeah. There is the notion of you get what you pay for, right? And, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, well, I, you know, I wasn't even paying attention for that, but the, yeah, those do kind of look old. <laughs> At least they're not on punch cards, right? <laughs> you can also do searches for uh, Creative Commons license thing through, um, through Flickr. Flickr is a very popular um, online photo sharing site. So let's pick another topic, skiing. I can do a search. And then I can go to advanced search. And I can filter and say 
only show me Creative Commons ones and ones that I can use commercially. Then if I wanted to adapt it, in other words, I want to put a picture of me skiing next to the picture person skiing, I could click that, do a search. Does Photobucket do the same thing? Not sure. 